All right, hello everybody, and welcome to this introduction to Adobe Photoshop class. I am Diego Delgado. Um, I am, like I said, my name is Diego Delgado. I have been a student at the University of New Mexico for like the past four years. I'm a senior studying uh, graphic design and computer science um, with an extra emphasis on the Adobe Suite. And I'm working with RAC6 to bring this training to you today. Um, this is my email. Um, if throughout the course of this lesson, um, you have any questions that maybe we can't answer right here in the moment, or if you run into anything down the line that you just want a little bit more assistance on, uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time. I'm here to answer any questions you have on um, Photoshop, any of my past sessions, or really just anything that you want to know about graphic design or the Adobe Suite uh, apps that I'll be covering in these series of lessons. Um, so Adobe Photoshop, uh, what is it? Um, Adobe Photoshop is a raster graphics editing software by Adobe. Um, it's really neat. It has a lot of really cool AI technologies um, that really help workflow in terms of editing raster graphics. Um, it's probably the most well-known Adobe app. I mean, who hasn't heard of Photoshop? Um, it's really great for shifting colors, um, warping images, fixing imperfections, but really the applications of Photoshop are almost endless. You, you can do just so darn much with it. Um, so you heard me say, uh, you probably heard me say that it's a raster graphics editing software. Um, what does that mean? Uh, well, we usually refer to graphics or images as being either raster or vector. Um, but what, what, what's the difference? What are their strengths and weaknesses? What does it mean to be raster or vector? Um, raster graphics uh, raster graphics are made up of a bunch of separate pixels or pixel clusters um, that are combined to basically form images. Um, over here on the right, you can see a very zoomed in image of a raster graphic. Um, and as you can probably tell, raster graphics will eventually look pixelated if you scale them up too much. Um, on the other hand, you have vector graphics. Um, vector graphics are uh, different in, in the way they display graphics because they actually use mathematics and equations to create images that will look the same at any size. No matter how you scale it, it will always look crisp and sharp. Um, vector graphics are basically infinitely scalable. Um, if you had an infinite resolution screen and you displayed a vector graphic on it, it would look the same at any size. Um, now you may be thinking, um, this looks a lot better than this. So why would I ever use a raster graphic over a vector graphic? And well, the truth is that when you get down to it and you're not zooming in a ton, the differences can be pretty negligible. You might see a little bit of feathering. You might see a little bit of noise uh, around your shapes. Um, but put side by side, they look pretty similar. And vector graphics has plenty of drawbacks too. Um, I'll be talking more about uh, vector graphics and their weaknesses and strengths in my Adobe Illustrator class um, coming up. Um, and I will, uh, but we're going to be mostly focusing on raster graphics for today. So before we move on to the next topic. I just want to make sure that everyone's grasping vector graphics versus raster graphics um, for the time being. Thank you, Diego. Great explanation. Because <laughs> I was just going to put that in the chat. What is raster? <laughs> um, does, does that clear it up? Or is there anything else you would like to maybe get an idea of? Oh, and uh, I will mention that um, I'm going to be including um, some resources. I'll give you guys the link um, to a, a document that has um, 
some useful information that just goes into a little bit more depth on these things um, at the very end um, of the PowerPoint. I'll, I'll, I'll link you to some resources. It'll give you just more uh, specifics than I can cover um, in the time we have. Yeah. All right, is there any other questions or anything, any notes? All right, we'll be moving on then, I think. Oh, hold on, my, my laptop seems to be frozen up. I'm sorry, guys, I'm getting some technical difficulties. I don't know why. Oh, there we go, okay. All right, so moving on, um, we're going to be talking about file types as they apply to Adobe Photoshop. Um, so Adobe Photoshop supports a bunch of different uh, files, uh, uh, even some files that aren't necessarily image files. Um, but for the basics, we're going to be talking about the PSD file, the TIFF file, PNG, PDF, JPEG, and GIF or GIF um, file, file types. Um, so what does that mean? Starting out, we have the PSD file or the .psd file. Um, the PSD file is the, is, it's a Photoshop document. It's the doc, the native file format for Adobe Photoshop. Um, it allows documents to be opened in Photoshop and edited. Um, they are lossless files and the lossless file type because there's no compression whatsoever. It's the original Photoshop file. Um, however, uh, it's not great a great file type in the interest of sharing and in the interest of um, like sending to people because it needs Photoshop access in order to be opened uh, to whoever you send it to. Um, so keep that in mind, but if you're, you know, working on a creative team that has access to Photoshop, it's, it's a, it's the, the actual Photoshop document that is being edited. Um, now, if you don't have access to Photoshop and you don't really care about editing the image, you just want a really high quality, um, lossless, uh, image, raster image. Uh, then you're probably going to want to go with the TIFF file or the .tiff file. TIFF stands for Tagged Image File Format. Um, it supports lossless compression for raster graphics and image data. Um, since it's lossless, it's going to take up a lot of memory. So if you have limited storage space, maybe it's not the best idea. Um, but it is pretty much unparalleled in terms of um, really professional level scans and prints. Um, however, it's not really super streamlined either. It's not supported in a lot of different situations. Um, you'll see like, uh, when you're on the web and you have the option to upload an image, um, a lot of times you're prompted to upload a PDF, PNG, JPEG. You're not going to run into TIFF a ton in terms of the internet or the web. Um, but it is a really high quality file, uh, format. Um, similarly, we have the PNG, uh, which stands for Portable Network Graphics, um, also supports lossless compression uh, for raster graphics and image data. Um, again, it's lossless, so it's going to take up a little bit more memory on your machines. Um, if uh, data, if you need to be conserving that or conservative with that, um, maybe again, look for a slightly different uh, file format. But it has its strengths. It's it's super high quality. Um, PNGs can be a little bit smaller than TIFF files, and it's just how how the different file types handle um, lossless compression. Um, and since PNGs are usually a little bit smaller, they're a little bit more suited for web design. Um, and something kind of unique to PNGs, not just PNGs, but they're they're definitely the minority in this, is that they support transparency. And um, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in my Adobe Illustrator class. Um, but it does have a channel for transparency, which is very useful in creating things like logos. Um, moving on, we have the PDF. Uh, PDF stands for Portable Document Format. 
um, does support lossless compression for raster or vector graphics. That's an important thing to note is that it supports lossless compression for raster or vector graphics. Um, cool thing about PDFs is that they can actually have content embedded in them, uh, content like buttons and hyperlinks and stuff like that. And um, if you are interested in putting a button or hyperlink in your PDF, I highly recommend utilizing Adobe Acrobat for that. Um, real intuitive, real user-friendly Adobe Acrobat. Um, we also have the JPEG or the .jpeg file. Um, it stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. JPEG is a lossy format. Um, it, you're going to lose image quality in compression. Um, however, lossy formats mean smaller files, so they take up less uh, memory on your machine. Um, JPEG prioritizes retaining color information over other image data. So um, it's pretty safe if, you're, if your main focus of your image is the colors and the vibrancy and all that. Um, but it's not the highest quality um, image uh, format that you can have. Um, however, again, has its strengths. Since it's so small, it's really good for web design because um, it, it's easy to load. It, it's, it doesn't take ages to load because it's a smaller file. Um, and then moving on, we have the GIF or GIF or .gif or .gif file. Um, GIF uh, stands for Graphics Interchange Format. Um, they support transparency. Compression can be a little bit weird on GIF files. Um, they have the potential to be lossless, but there are situations where, where they are not. Um, they can be lossless when assembled right. Uh, but let me give you an example. Um, uh, one of the kind of key features of a GIF is that it's a moving image. It's, it's playing a series of images to kind of create the uh, illusion of a video. Um, and it's really great if, if you're assembling your GIF out of a bunch of high quality still images. However, if you have a, um, GIFs can only be played at like 15 to 25 FPS or like that's the standard. Um, but if you have a, a 60, frame per second of uh, video, and you try and convert that to a, a GIF, then um, you're going to have data loss because it can only show half as many frames as it were actually there. So you're actually losing a lot of uh, data. Um, however, again, the strengths uh, often used in web design because they're easier to load on the web page than a uh, .mp4 or .mov file uh, or like basically video alternatives. Um, it's important to note GIFs don't have sound because they're not a, a video file. They are kind of simulating, they're kind of posing as a video file, but they're not. They're, they're just a series of images being played one after another. Um, so they don't have sound. They pretty much will, they will never have sound. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's the GIF file. Quick note on the GIF file. Um, the G in GIF or GIF does technically stand for graphics or graphical. Um, so the correct, correct pronunciation is technically GIF, but you'll hear me personally using GIF and GIF interchangeably, interchangeably because I think that GIF just sounds better as a word. Um, but yes, technically the correct pronunciation is GIF because the G in GIF stands for graphical. All right, and... You probably heard me say a couple times, or pretty much every for every one of those files, the, the word lossless or lossy. Um, that refers to its compression, how that specific file type handles compression. Um, so what is compression? Um, well, lossless compression, as I mentioned in several of the file formats, is a class of data compression that allows the original data to be perfectly reconstructed from the compressed data with no loss of information. Lossless compression is possible because most real world data exhibits statistical redundancy. By contrast, lossy compression permits reconstruction only of an approximation of the original data. 
though usually with greater improved compression rates and therefore re re reduced media size. So that's a mouthful. That's, that's, like, that's literally the Wikipedia definition. Um, when it comes down to it, it's just think of it like this. If you, if you have a file, it has a bunch of, of um, data attached to it and associated with it that has nothing to do with the actual displaying or quality of the image. So when you have lossless compression, the, the, the file just takes that out. It just takes that chunk of data out and you can see the image in its original quality. Um, even without that data. So that's lossless compression. Lossy compression is where you actually start to ch cut out um, image information that is associated with the quality of the image. So you're going to see a reduced quality image when you use lossy compression. All right. So that's compression. Um, are there any questions on any of those file types or the concept of compression? Uh, yes, Terry. Um, quick question, Diego. So for the novice uh, Photoshop user, um, which, which of those formats would would be easiest for us to use. I'm thinking JPEG, I don't know, PNG, which one would you say that we would want to use? So in my experience, well, I, like I said, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. But in my experience, you're just from what I end up using the most, you're mostly going to be using PNG, PDF, JPEG, and that's that, those are like the main formats. If you if you're sending something off to a printer to have have it printed at really high quality, you have an image you want it printed really crisp and really clean, then consider like a PNG or a, a TIFF. But you're mostly going to be using PDF, uh, PNG, and JPEG uh, files. I'm pretty sure. Great, thank you. All right, um, moving on. We're going to be discussing color modes as they apply to Adobe Photoshop. Um, so what is a color mode? Color modes refer to the settings that designers use to display colors um, in a consistent and measurable manner. Um, some color modes are RGB, CMYK, LAB, index, grayscale, and bitmapping. That's a bunch of different color modes for this class. And honestly, pretty much for Photoshop, we're, we're going to be mainly focusing on RGB and CMYK color modes. So let's talk more about them. Um, the RGB color mode. RG, the R, G, and B in RGB stand for red, green, and blue. Um, RGB is most commonly found in digital or electronic formats. Um, and you can see that in the way that um, pixels are actually made. Uh, pixels on a screen are actually green, red, and blue, or red, uh, red, green, and blue. Um, uh, like one of the ways that you might see that in the nature in nature is um, if you've ever got like a droplet of water on your phone screen or something like that, a lot of times it actually magnifies those um, pixels up and you can actually see the individual red, green, and blue pixels. Um, or if you're if you're dealing with just a lower resolution screen, you're going to see that. Um, on the other side, we have CMYK. Um, CMYK stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, you see this a lot in printers when you're going to um, replace your uh, printer ink filament cartridge. Um, it's most likely going to be coming in cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Um, and since it's used in printers, you're mostly going to use it in print formats. Um, and, uh, yeah, basically the difference is just, um, is are you using red, green, and blue or are you using cyan, magenta, yellow, and black to represent all of the colors in your image? Um, so 
that's all well and good, but how do you choose a color mode? What makes one better over another? Um, it, it, there's a million one ways you could go about doing this, but um, the main thing you're probably going to want to consider when choosing a color mode is just uh, choosing the color mode that suits your specific needs. And usually there's two main needs you're going to have when working in Photoshop. Um, basically, use CMYK when your image is going to be printed because it'll be optimized for the ink in your printer. Um, use RGB when you're dealing with digital images. It, it's never going to be printed. It's only ever going to be represented by red, green, and blue pixels, so it'll be optimized for that. Um, so that's color modes. Are there any questions on color modes? No, that was a really good explanation. Thank you, Diego. All right, well, if there's no questions on color modes, we'll just move right along. So we're gonna, we're gonna get to actually opening up a Photoshop document here pretty soon. But before we can do that, I want to discuss just real quick um, with height and resolution and how they apply to a Photoshop document. Um, width and height. In Photoshop, and honestly, most of the Adobe suite, um, you're going to have to be dealing with width and height. Um, width and height are measured in pixels, inches, centimeters, millimeters, points, and um, picas. Um, you mainly consider this when you're actually setting up your Photoshop document um, from scratch at the very beginning. It can be a little bit tricky to change these things once you're Photoshop document is created. So you really want to want to think about it for a second before you make it in the first place. You want to make sure that you're you're choosing the appropriate width and height for the project that you're working on. Um so that's width and height and width and height are of course very closely connected with resolution. Um resolution is measured in pixels per inch or pixels per centimeter in Photoshop. Um again, you mainly consider it when setting up a document from scratch. Um, when you actually first open a Photoshop document or when you're going to set up a Photoshop document, um, the default is 72 pixels per inch. Um, and 72 pixels per inch is, it's pretty good. It's the standard for the web and it's the standard in, in a lot of different scenarios. Um, but if you're going for a really high, uh, quality image, uh, don't be afraid to go above that. I mean, when I, when I do work, I regularly go over 300 pixels per inch and um it'll increase your file size a little bit but um it's worth it when you're trying to get a really high quality edit or a really high quality image um so that was uh height width and resolution as they apply to photoshop documents um and before we completely move on i just want to make sure that you guys are confident with the idea of um, raster versus vector graphics, file types, and the file types in, in Photoshop, um, the RGB and CMYK color modes, and with height and resolution as they apply to Photoshop in these increments. Diego, this is April. I understand a uh, raster versus vector color modes resolution uh, you know hi, with high resolution and and resolution i'm probably going to have to see that in action to understand mm -hmm. it further but i did understand your um vocab you know your lesson so that's good okay that's good to hear anyone else um diego question on the width and height you said that we have to set that but if when we're starting a new project? Yes. Um, what guides us choosing the width and height? Is it the project we're working on or our preference? Um, both, yeah, both. But um, okay, so there's basically two ways that you will open up and start working on a Photoshop document. Um, the first way is the way that we're actually going to be working on some of the projects a little bit later. And they are, um, by actually choosing a photo, or a, not a photo, but an image 
um, uploading it to Photoshop, opening it in Photoshop, and editing it from there. Um, that's if you have an image. Um, if you want to set up a document where maybe you combine images or elements from separate images, or um, I mean, Photoshop is used a lot for even just digital art. Um, so if you want just a blank canvas with, with no images on it, and, and you kind of want to be able to add things and subtract things freely without being limited by the original resolution and the original height and width of importing an image, that's when you're going to want to know width, height, resolution um, for, for setting up a blank document. Um, but you will just inherit the original width and height and resolution if you just import an image from your uh, computer. Does Thank that help? You. Yes, that makes okay. sense. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, if, um, if no one else has any questions, I am going to move right along. Um, we're going to be um, actually looking at some applications of Photoshop, getting, getting a little comfortable with the software. Um, so let's go ahead and just open up a Photoshop document real quick. Um, It's it's like you said, it can be helpful to actually see it in practice and actually look at the dialogues and see what what the heck those things mean that um I was referring to. Um oh, but um before we get too far into that, let me go ahead and give you guys the link to some of these resources I was telling you guys about. Um, I'll go ahead and just put them in the chat. Google Docs. If you guys could do me a favor and just make sure that you can open that and see that okay. In, in, and in this um, document, you're going to find my email. Uh, you're going to find a really cool article actually by Adobe that goes into the differences between raster and vector graphics. Um, you're going to uh, be able to find more information on, oh, on uh, file types um, in Adobe products, uh, name, uh, mainly Photoshop. Um, a little bit more information on losses compression, uh, a little bit more information on color modes, and especially the color modes that we didn't necessarily discuss, um, uh, bitmap and stuff like that, um, image styles, file size and uh, resolution, um, and copyright and fair use. We're going to be discussing that a little bit later. Um, it's, it's really important to know when you're going to be working with uh, images. Um, and this second page, this is going to be all... Um, lesson files. If you choose to file follow along um, in Photoshop, or if you ever want to uh, take a look back at this recording and follow along, these are going to be those um, be some uh, images to actually be working with. All right, but um, that's that's uh, those are the resources. Let's actually open Photoshop. Okay, so when you first open Photoshop, you're probably going to see something very similar to this. Um, if you've used Photoshop before, it might look a little bit different. You might have some recent files down here, but um, you might get some dialogue uh, boxes. You might get some pop-ups telling you, hey, take the tour, or, or hey, what's new to Photoshop? Um, but... Um, uh, for the time being, we're going to ignore those things, and we're just going to talk about this this startup screen that you get when you open Photoshop. Um, from here, uh, I'm going to walk you through how to just, uh, like I said, open a blank document. It, it doesn't have an image associated with it. Um, it's just going to be a white canvas. Um, okay, so let's do that. We're going to go over here to New File, this big blue, like, 
pill shape. Um, and you're going to get this pop up. Um, it's going to show you, hey, this is the default Photoshop size. Um, but over here is where we're actually interested in, in setting up our document from scratch. Um, we can see width, we can see height, we can see resolution, and we can see color modes. Um, some of this other stuff, it, it's important, but um, we're just going to ignore it for now because it's a little bit more advanced. Um, cool thing is there's just this really cool drop down right here. You can choose basically what increments you want to be working in for your time in Photoshop. Um, I usually go with pixels or inches um, because a lot of the time I find myself working uh, on sizes that can be printed on just regular uh, printer paper. So if I'm going to be doing that, I'm going to choose inches. Uh, regular printer paper is eight and a half by 11 inches. So I'm going to say 8.5 wide, 11 inches tall. I'm going to, and this is where you can actually save this preset for later. Um, I'm going to just call it paper. Um, and I'll, I'm basically saying, hey, I want to be able to use this uh, ratio again in the future. Um, and I want it to be eight and a half inches wide by 11 inches tall. Um, I'm going to leave it at 300 uh, pixels per inch because I just, I like that resolution. It's a nice medium, I think. It's a little bit higher quality than your, your standard um, 72 uh, pixels per inch. But, um, but it's not so crazy that like it's going to slow down your machine or take up just a ridiculous amount of space. And um, since I'm not really worried about printing it for now, I'm going to leave it at RGB color. And I'm going to go ahead and just click create, and we'll see what that does. It'll take a second. Uh, this is a very powerful software, so it, it, you'll, you'll notice some load times from time to time. And there we go. We have this big white work area in the middle now. And we can, we can see that uh, it's, it's um, well, let me make sure. Yeah, OK. So this is eight and a half by 11 inches, this white work area in the middle. Um, in case you don't believe me, uh, you can, I, I recommend doing this right away when you're opening up a Photoshop document um, or Illustrator document. Honestly, most of the Adobe um, suite supports this. And so you're going to want to go to uh, view. You're going to want to go to uh, rulers and it's going to enable your rulers for you. And um, that's all. That's all well and good, but this, this is, this is, this doesn't mean anything to me because I'm working in inches. So I'm gonna go to file. Um, hold on, let me find it. It can take some time. Sometimes, um, file info. I think. No, this isn't it. Um, Where is it? Isn't it usually here? Um, preferences, that's what it is. Uh, interface. Space. Um, units and rulers. Um, and it sees, you can see here that the rulers are by default set to be in pixels. I'm going to change that to inches. Um, and press OK, and that should update. And there we go. Now we can see that my document is, in fact, eight and a half inches by 11 inches. Oh, yeah, they really do bury that setting. Um, and it's so crazy because, like, you'd think that if you were setting up a document and you say, I want it to be eight and a half by 11 inches, you'd think that it would be like, oh yeah, so let's give it, give, give the units of measure in inches, but it doesn't do that. They do bury that setting and I'm sorry, it took me a little bit uh, to find it, um, but for anyone that missed it, just again, edit, preferences, interface, 
scroll down over here to um, uh, units and rulers, and that's where you'll find that. Um, yep. Okay. So how much time do we have left? Okay, we've still got some time. Um, all right. So that's cool. We've got a Photoshop document right in front of us. Awesome. Um, it's eight and a half by 11 inches. Um, the next thing I'm going to want to show you guys is actually not a blank document. We're actually going to be bringing in a document that I have prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and just close this because I, uh, I don't really need it. And since I haven't made any changes to it, it's not going to prompt me to save it. Um, so I'm going to go back to here. I'm going to go to the doc that I gave you guys um, and go to this file right here that says um, zoom slash move practice. That's what I want. So I'm going to download this image, download it, take a second. Um, if you're following along, please do the same. Um, and then I'm going to hold on, get the chat out of the way. Um, go back to Photoshop. Okay. So now this is going to be a little bit different. Uh, before we made a new file and it gave us all that cool dialogue and uh, what, how, how many pixels per inch do you want and what width and height do you want? When you're bringing in an image that just already has those things associated with it, you're not going to click new file. You're going to click open. And from here, it's going to show you, you know, a bunch of different options. That image just got downloaded. So I'm going to go to my downloads and I'm going to open this Zoom Move Practice. Might take a second because like I said, it, it's just, it's a big, uh, it's a big powerful software. So you'll experience some load times. So, okay. I'm going to do some things real quick that I'm going, uh, um, I'm going to zoom in but I'm going to teach you how to do that in a really useful way. Um, I know that keyboard shortcuts can be like a slippery slope because um, you, you don't want to learn a bunch of you know fancy commands just to be able to use a software. And uh, the Adobe Suite supports a lot of keyboard commands. And they're not even always the same between apps. So you need to learn one set of keyboard commands for one application and another set of keyboard commands for another application. And it can kind of get annoying. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about a bunch of different um, keyboard commands, but these are the two that I find myself using the most. Um, yeah, no kidding. Um, and, and they are just the zoom function and the move function. So right here, I have three targets. Okay, and if you open this up, uh, you'll see these three targets. Um, if you want to zoom in on something, you can click Control, and while holding Control, click Space, and um, you'll get it. Your cursor should turn into like a little magnifying glass with a plus sign. If you're on an Apple machine, it's not going to be Control Space. It's probably going to be Command Space. Um, but I'm on a Windows machine, so Control plus Space plus click zooms in. Um, and that's cool. I can zoom in, but how do I zoom out? Well, if you hold control space and then the alt key and click, you'll be able to zoom out. Now, this is great, but there's actually one better way to zoom in and out on Photoshop document. And rather than having to hold three keys down at the same time to be able to zoom out or zoom in or whatever, um, you can hold control, space, and then when you're going to go to click, don't click yet, but when you go to click, click and then immediately drag to the right to zoom in and drag to the left to zoom out. And if you're going to try this for yourself, just try and get comfortable with this. Um, so right here, I, I'm going to put my cursor over this uh, target all the way on the left. Control, space, click and drag to zoom in. Click and drag to zoom out. Middle target, click and drag to zoom in. Click and drag to zoom out. 
Last target, we can drag to zoom in, we can drag to zoom out. This is how I like to operate because it just saves so much time. Uh, the alternative is to, um, I think it's, nope, that's not it. Um, is it. Is it window or is it view? It's view. The alternative is to go to the view uh, uh, tab at the top, come all the way down here to zoom in and zoom out and go in increments like this. This is pretty much your alternative, which will work, but it's just a lot faster to do this. All right, so moving on, you'll probably have seen me do this a couple times already. It's just the holding space and your cursor should turn into like an open palm, like a hand and click, drag around to move. So now we're going to combine these two keyboard commands. I'm going to have you control space, drag in to this bottom target. Actually, let's zoom out a little bit. That's a little bit too much. And then center it on your screen by holding space and dragging. OK, cool. Now let me navigate to this target over here. Center it on your screen. Cool. Last target. Move down here, center it on your screen. Cool. So that is the two keyboard commands that I recommend learning for Adobe Photoshop, just because it's going to optimize your workflow. You're not going to have to go through all those, those cluttered dialogues, and you're, it's just going to be a lot better. Um, yeah, these, uh, I mean, th I know a significant portion of the of the um like the keyboard commands for photoshop but um i like rarely use them these are the main ones that i use just because it's what you need to navigate your document and be able to look at a document at the size you want it at the place you want it all this stuff all right so we've still got a little bit more time let's go ahead and move right along um uh, is everyone comfortable with this uh, before we move on, actually, I don't want to, this is, this is a important part of working with Photoshop. So I just want to make sure everyone's feeling good about this. Yes. Good. Good. Cool. All right. Well, then we're going to move on to a slightly more real um, project because we really we, we opened this file, but we didn't really do anything with it other than move around it. So we're going to go ahead and close this. And since I didn't make any changes to it, it's not going to ask me to save it. Um, but uh, we're going to go ahead and go back to our resources. Um, scroll down. You're going to find this, uh, this section labeled pizza files. Um, this is what we want. So I mean, it's, it's going to be a folder. So um, locate it in the, in the lesson files that I provided. Uh, just in case anyone's joining us now, I'm going to put the link in the chat again. Um, in case you didn't get these earlier. All right. OK, so OK, so navigate to the pizza files. It's going to be a link to a drive folder. Um, click on it. And you're going to get um, a bunch of PNGs, basically. We're going to want to download all of them. So. Cheese, crust, pepperoni, sauce, slices, PNG. Um, I'm going to want to go ahead and download all of those. Might take a second. Does that work? Oh, it's working. There we go. Okay. 
So um, you're probably going to receive it in a zipped up format if you're working on Windows, especially. Um, go ahead and unzip it. Um, it. It'll probably be in your downloads. Um, extract all. Just go ahead and put it in downloads. Might take a second. Working on it, working on it. Cool. Now you have five PNGs that you can work with. So we're going to go to Photoshop and we're going to go to open. And here's the thing. Um, think of a pizza, like literally think about a real life pizza. What is the, you're going to want to think what's the bottom most layer of a pizza out of these options anyway, it's going to be the crust. So since the crust is our most like baseline, bottom most, most background image, we're going to open that first. So click on crust, click on open. It'll take some time. Okay, cool. Now we have a circle in our Photoshop document. That's cool, but that a circle doesn't make up a pizza. We want more things. So in this section of the lesson, I'm going to talk to you guys about layers because layers are one of the most fundamental and most important aspects of working in Adobe Photoshop. So we have the bottom most layer, it's the crust, cool. But we want more. So when you have an image already, but you want more images to work with in your document, um, we're going to do what's called embedding so or placing. Click File, go to um, doo -doo -doo. Place Embedded under File. It'll pull up your dialog. And then what's the next most logical thing to put on a pizza? I think it's sauce, probably. So I'm going to place the sauce. Cool. And it's going to automatically center in in the in the document or it should anyway if it doesn't you you can just click this check mark to say yeah that's where i want it and then make sure you have this uh move tool selected and then just drag it around into place in case it's not already centered okay now that's cool what's what's going on over here oh i have a new layer now i have a new layer in my layer stack um, and the layer one is called layer one. I don't know why it's doing that. It should be called um, crust. Eh, that's not important. <laughs> but um, so yeah, in our layer stack now, we have two layers, one on top of another. And you'll see this little eye icon next to each layer um, that toggles the visibility. Um, so let's say I want to look at what the crust looks like without the sauce on it. Click on the little eye and the red disappears. It's still there. It's just not visible. Turn it back on, it's visible again. All right, so let's go ahead and just finish assembling this pizza. Um, file, do the same thing again. Place embedded, cheese, place. Should be centered, cool. Toggle the cheese to see how the sauce and the crust look like. Toggle the sauce, see just how the crust looks like. Cool, all right. Moving right along, let's get the last couple layers in here. Place embedded. Uh, what would be next? Uh, pepperoni. This is just a pepperoni pizza. It's nothing too crazy. All right, cool. Got pepperonis on our pizza. This looks like a pizza, but it's not sliced. So now we're just going to add lines, basically, that will show it being sliced. Place. Confirm, and there we go. Now we have a pizza. And really, if you saw like the constructive nature of what we just did, we just combined simple shapes to make something that looks like a thing. It's, it's like alone, these things don't really mean anything. But when you combine them, they kind of look like a pizza. Um, and that's basically one of the main things you're going to be doing in Photoshop probably is combining 
elements, combining photos, combining graphics to form something that is basically bigger than the sum of its parts, if that makes any sense. Right on. Okay. All right. We can probably get away with a little bit more. Um, let's uh, let's show toggling. Um, actually, can I just uh, ask everyone, how many of you plan on coming to the afternoon session? Yeah. All right. Uh, for anyone who is not planning to come to the afternoon session, um, I encourage you to ask any questions now because we're going to be going into a little bit more depth of some of the tools in the afternoon session. Um, but if you have any questions, I really encourage you to uh, get those out now or or email me. It, it's, you can ask them now and, and that's fine. But like I said, I gave you my email. You can always contact me whenever. If there's no specific questions, I'm going to give you guys just a little bit more of a tour of the um, Photoshop workspace, if that's OK. Because we've, we've discussed how to embed. We've discussed how to add your rulers. We've discussed all this stuff. But um, there's a couple more uh, important uh, features to take away if you can't come to the afternoon session. So. Probably one of the big ones that you run into right out of the gates with Photoshop is okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna select this pepperoni layer, and I'm gonna I'm gonna you can drag it around. You can you can just as long as you have it selected, you can you can pick it up, move it around, all that. But you might see some of this weird stuff going on. What's this magenta line over here on the left? What does that mean? Photoshop has these things called smart guides, and basically what that is is they are. They are the software saying, if you put this item down here, it will line up with some other item, or maybe not even an item, but just like a significant part of the page. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Is um so these pepperonis aren't even on the pizza anymore. You know, they're 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 skew, they're they're all willy-nilly, but I want them to be perfectly centered again. So I'm gonna kind of eyeball it, try and shoot for the center, and it's going to snap to the center. And you're going to see magenta lines going up the middle and down uh, up the middle vertically and down the middle uh, horizontally. And that means that it's centered. That means it's centered in the document. Um, and if we kind of just eyeball it, we can tell that looks pretty centered. So those are smart guides. If you're working on a really precise thing that you don't want Photoshop, like, I, I, don't, I don't want Photoshop trying to interpret what I'm doing. It, it keeps getting it wrong. It's snapping my, my stuff around when I don't want it to. That's okay. Um, there's ways to uh, disable your, um, your smart guides. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, it's in Snap, Snap 2. And these are just all of the things that your elements are gonna try and snap to automatically. It does that to try and help you out. And in a lot of cases, it's really helpful, but in some cases it's just less helpful. So if I don't want it to be snapping to my smart guides, uh, go to view, guides, or no, view, snap to, and uncheck guides. For now, I want guides on, so I'm gonna leave that as is. Um, okay, we have a little bit more time, so let's try and get a little bit more here. Um, so uh, real quick, Real quick overview of just this toolbar on the left, okay? There's a lot of toolbars, or there's a lot of tools over here in the toolbar on the left. And here's the thing. This isn't even remotely all of the tools that Photoshop has. Uh, they try and give you just the most used ones. And most of the time, it is it is the most used ones. Um, but here's the funny thing. Um, this lasso tool, and, and okay, just a, just a quick side note. If you notice that one of the tools has a little little tiny light gray triangle on the bottom right of its tool icon. That means that it has more options for that tool. So if you want to access those more options, go to click on it, but hold down 
And when you hold down, you'll get this other little tab that'll extend out to the side and it'll show you like the hidden options for that tool. Um, so one of the main things you're gonna be doing in Photoshop is selecting things. Um, and when you're like, like Photoshop just offers a lot of ways to select things. They, it's, it's just like, I'll show you an example. Um, again, I'm gonna go ahead and click my pepperoni layer um, just to make sure I'm working on the right layer. Um, you can, th this, is, this is one of the main ones you're gonna be using. It's called the lasso tool. Um, you can use it to literally draw around something and it'll make a selection uh, in that shape. Now this, this little blob here is selected. Um, if you wanna unselect something, I know I wasn't gonna get too crazy with the, the keyboard commands, but you can click control D to unselect or you can make a selection. And if you don't want that selection present anymore, go to select, deselect. Those are the two ways that you can deselect something. Um, so that's the lasso tool, but there's also the polygonal lasso tool. Um, and basically what this is, is instead of drawing, you draw points. And every time you click, it makes an anchor point. And you use this to make straight line selections. Okay. And um, I'm honestly not going to cover the magnetic lasso tool just because honestly, I don't find needing it very often. Let's just jump right here real quick into the quick selection tool and the object selection tool. And then of course, the magic wand tool, something that some of you might be familiar with just because it's so iconic. Um, quick selection tool allows you to um, make a quick selection. You kind of paint in your selection and it's different from the um, lasso tool because rather than drawing a straight line, it kind of draws like a blob. And it, the, the uh, AI tries to kind of fill in the gaps and say, yeah, you probably meant to be selecting this. And it tries to make a guess as best as you can. I use the quick select tool a lot. Um, so definitely know how to use that. And then there's the object selection tool. We're gonna actually see this in action a little bit uh, later in the afternoon session. But basically just know the object selection tool, it's really cool. It's, it's flawed. It, it doesn't work 100% right all the time, but it tries its best and a lot of time that's good enough. Um, object selection tool, you drag over an area and it basically says, I'm gonna try and find an object in that area and select it. Um, bam, there we go. So it selected, it looks like all of the pepperonis, cool. That's really useful because we didn't have to go in and select every single pepperoni by hand. Um, it just picked all of them out for us. And that was just all the software doing the work, heavy work for you. Um, really useful tool. This is a really simple image, so it worked really well. It'd be a little bit less accurate when you're dealing with more complicated images. But that worked really well. And I think that puts us out of time. So um, I'll take any questions now if you have any. Um, Anyone, feel free. Um, any questions you have? Looking forward to reviewing the recording. And uh, you got the access, the, you were able to access the lesson files? Yes, okay, cool. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much for coming, everyone. And thank you, REC6, for, um, helping to provide this lesson today.